We want to go over the health related components of fitness and how they're used in pretesting. So, the very first measurement you'll take when you do pretesting, it should be blood pressure. So, if you have access to the clients or you're in contact with them, warn, warn them not to take any stimulants before they come in because if they take anything like caffeine, it's a vasoconstrictor and it'll also increase their heart rate. So not only do the vessels narrow, but the heart rate increases, that'll cause blood pressure to go up and you won't get a true reading. So you want them to rest about five to 10 minutes before they do blood pressure. So when they arrive, have them, to sit, have them sit down without their legs crossed because that'll also cause blood pressure to go up because there's a huge artery in your leg, the femoral artery, and if you cross your legs, it'll, it'll have an impact on blood pressure. So after they've rested for about five minutes, then you can go ahead and do blood pressure. So average for a man is 120 over 80, and then average for a female is 110 over 70. But don't worry about it. If you have a female's blood pressure and it's 120 over 80, don't worry about it. Um, now, if they're between 120 over 80 and 130 over 90, that's prehypertensive. That means they need to start watching their blood pressure. Um, but a one-time reading is not your true blood pressure. What a doctor would have you do is take it several times throughout a week at different times of the day and then average those numbers together. So just because you get a one-time number doesn't mean you have high blood pressure or that you're pre-hypertensive. It just means you need to pay attention to it. So any measurement over 130 over 90 is considered hypertensive and we need a, a doctor's release before they can do anything physical. So need to make sure that they've either been released by a doctor before so what I do is I just ask them is it okay have you seen a doctor do they know about this blood pressure issue and if so if they tell me that they've been cleared by a doctor and they can show proof of it then I'm good so a manual blood pressure reading uh, make sure that the cuff is close to the brachial artery that's the artery on the inside of the arm and I'll create videos to show you all how to do these and then you're going to take the stethoscope after you've pumped up the pressure and listen and the first time you hear that surge of blood that's systolic pressure and then as that pressure starts to release blood can go through that area and there's no turbulence that's what's creating the noise and once the cuff pressure gets light enough so it no longer makes any um, noise anymore the last time you hear that that'll be diastolic pressure so you pump up the cuff you release the pressure, you start to listen with the stethoscope over near that brachial artery, and then you hear a surge of blood. That's systolic. The last time you hear it is diastolic pressure. And this is just an illustration of how it works. So you've got the stethoscope, you've got this pumped up, and then as you release the pressure here, blood starts to go through. It has a lot of turbulence on it because that cuff is still pushing on it here, and that turbulence makes noise. So the first time you hear that turbulence, once that opens up a little bit, that's systolic pressure. And then eventually the cuff pressure gets so light that no turbulence is created and so no noise is made because the blood it can go through there nice and smooth. So the last time you hear it is diastolic pressure. So exercise and high blood pressure. So the main concern is we don't want to get extremely high heart rates and increase their blood pressure that could cause an aneurysm, a vessel to burst and that could, that could be fatal. So um, it's the same as like high water pressure in your house. You know, that's great for taking a shower, but eventually those pops will fail. If you have high blood pressure too long throughout your lifetime, same thing will happen to your plumbing, which is your vessels in your body, as they can rupture. So it's a, it's a long-term threat to your health, and you need to get it under control if you've had high blood pressure, because not only can it cause vessels to burst, but it can do damage to organs, especially the kidneys. So the health-related components of fitness, um, we use these for assessment, and, and they're really a measure of improvement, and, and we use them in our program design to find out what areas are we going to focus on. So we use those health-related components to find out which area we're going to focus on, or areas. It can be multiple, but we don't want too many, and uh, they allow us to kind of say, okay, I'm going to focus on muscle strength, or I'm going to focus on cardiorespiratory endurance. You know, you try to get a, a, a focal point. So that's how they're used in developing your fitness plan. So you have, um, on the pre-testing, you'll have non-physical measurements, which is like body composition and flexibility. Those are our two main ones of the health-related components that are not physical. 
right? We don't have to really do any major exercise to do them. We can do our body comp. Um, flexibility, even though we have to lean over and we may strain a little bit to, to do the sit and reach box, it's not necessarily considered physical because our heart rate's not going up. We're not exerting ourselves, so we put it into the non-physical category. Now, the physical measurements are like muscle endurance where we're doing push-ups to fatigue or muscle strength where we do a one rep max or cardiorespiratory endurance where we run a mile and a half. Those are pretty physical, so um, if anybody has an issue with blood pressure, you won't let them do any of the physical measurements until they get cleared by a doctor. So body composition. So we could do it as simply as girth measurements where we measure the smallest portion of our waist and then go around the biggest portion of our hips and do like a waist to hip measurement or we could do a BMI chart. BMI is not good for most people unless you're perfectly proportional. I wouldn't use BMI. It's not good for athletes. It's not good for people that are short in stature. It's not good for people under the age of 18. Um, calipers, that's where we're measuring subcutaneous body fat and where we have to actually pinch you and do um, some skin folds and then we look in a chart and find out your percent body fat. Biological impedance, where you step up on a scale, or maybe you've got a handheld one, or maybe it's a scale with the handheld. It runs an electrical signal through your body, and fat will impede that signal. So it's, it's hydrophobic, right? So it won't allow the signal to go through it. But muscle has a lot of fluid in it, right? A lot of hydration to it. So it does allow the signal to go through. And so we can get an estimate of lean mass versus fat mass and some other measurements along that as well. So hydrostatic weighing used to be the gold standard, it no longer is. Works of, of Archimedes' principle of water displacement. You get into a pool, get all the residual air volume out of your lungs, and then they sink you down, and how much water you displace gives us an estimate of percent body fat. It's still pretty good. It's better than most other field tests, but there is some measurement error. Body pod works off air displacement. So it's like this little eggshell that you get in. I'll show you a picture in just a sec and uh, you wear a little cap on top of your head and you're in some speedos or a skimpy bathing suit and it works off of air displacement because you don't want too much on you because then that's going to also displace air and then the DEXA scan is our new gold, gold standard it's an x-ray and then that can give you a true estimate of your percent body fat with very little measurement error so waist to hip here's some nor um, normative information on where you should be when you do your waist to hip so you don't want to be over um, greater than uh, 0.95 and you don't want to be greater than 0.86 for females. So males don't go over 0.95, females don't go over 0.86. That should make sense. You want the numerator much smaller than the denominator because that numerator is your waist measurement. So if it is a lot larger than the denominator, then you've got a lot of belly fat and that's a risk factor. So let me show you some air displacement. So there's body, the body pod, a little eggshell. Kind of reminds me of Mork and Mindy. And you get inside that, it displaces air. Here's a DEXA scan. Gives us a really good, it's an x-ray. And we can determine body composition based on that. That is the best. This is a sit and reach. And I'll have videos of how to do all of these, except for the DEXA scan and body pod, um, so that you can do your own measurements. So all that's measuring is lower back and hamstring flexibility so it's not the best measurement so if you got really long arms and short legs you do really well on this if it's the other way around where you got little t-rex arms and long legs you're not going to do so great but it, there's a lot of normative data because it's used in public school it's used in colleges so we have a lot of people to compare ourselves to and then muscle endurance these will be the tests that we do we'll do push-ups until fatigue and so you just do as many push-ups as you can until you can't go anymore. We'll do sit-ups for one minute, and we'll do lunges for one minute to test muscle endurance in the lower body. So this is how we'll do the push-ups, and I'll make a video of this so you don't have to just go by um, the instructions here. So for women, you'll be on your knees, arms about shoulder width apart. These are modified. And the reason we have women do that is most of the normative data is just for modified is just for women. And so you go all the way down. Normally you'll have like a little yoga block down there that you can touch your chin to. And that tells you that you've gone down far enough. But if you just focus on getting the arms to bend at a right angle, that works too. So that's, that's the modified. 
So here are the standard push-ups. Now, if you're a woman, it doesn't mean you can't do standard push-ups. It just means most of that information is comparing you to what men do. There may not be a lot of normative data for women, but if there is, use that. If not, and you're like, oh, there's no way I can do that many push-ups, just remember most of those charts are based off what men can do. So standard push-up, instead of being on our knees, we're on the balls of our feet. Again, arms are about shoulder width apart. If you're a woman, put a yoga block out in front so that your chin touches or try to get your arms to bend at a right angle. If you're a man, uh, put the yoga block at its smallest part, uh, at its not the tallest part, but go down about the thickness of somebody's fist. Go down, touch your chest to that, and back up. So sit-ups, we do these for one minute. So cross your arms in front, don't pull on the back of your head or neck, go all the way up, touch your elbows to your knees, back down. And see how many you can do for one minute. And make sure that your bottom is about 15 to 18 inches from your heels. You don't want your heels way out here because then you get the hip flexors to assist you and it makes it easier. So you want your heels to be fairly close to your bottom. Lunges, just make sure you step out far enough so that your knee is behind your big toe. If you take little baby steps, what will happen is your knee will go in front of your big toe and it causes a lot of anterior shear. And I, I don't care what you do with your arms when you're doing the lunges on your pretest. You can use them for balance. But make sure that you look straight ahead to keep your spine in line and that you step out far enough. And I'll make a video on that. Cardiovascular endurance. Do a one and a half mile walk run test. How fast can you do that one and a half mile walk? Or you can do a step test. That's a three minute step test. For my online students, I'm going to have you do the one and a half mile walk run. How fast can you do that? Please don't give me numbers like I did it in four minutes because that's faster than the world record. I have that all happen all the time. And I have to tell my online students, you realize that that is faster than the world record time. So resting heart rate, um, how do you take your resting heart rate manually? Most of these automated blood pressure cuffs will do it for you, but if it doesn't and you need to take it, you can use a carotid artery or pulse. So you just take the pad of two fingers, put in between the Adam's apple and the sternocleidomastoid muscle and you'll feel it, or the radial pulse, which is what most of those um, heart rate monitors that, are, um, that you don't have to wear the band on, they just go on your wrist, that's what they're checking. So um, it's right, you've got the radius on the outside near your thumb, the ulna on the inside, so you get near the radius bone between those tendons, and you can feel it. So just push in. Make sure you're not using your thumb, though. Your thumb has a pulse. So um, use the pad of two fingers when you take it, and that gives you averages for resting heart rate between 60 and 80. If you have really good cardiovascular fitness, you might have a resting heart rate down in the 50s, uh, maybe even the upper 40s. So um, anyway, so you, you count for 10 seconds. So you watch a clock and see how many t times that you can count your heart rate in that 10 seconds and then multiply it by 6. Or you can count it how many times it beats in 15 seconds and multiply it by 4. You're, the idea here is you're trying to see how many times your heart is beating in a minute. And you don't want to sit there and try to count it out for a minute, especially if your heart rate's really high. But if you're doing resting heart rate, that's the easiest way to do it.